Well, good morning, Walden Church. Good morning. As you can see, I am not there. I am not there. Uh, my wife and family and I, we are in Branson, Missouri. We are on vacation. And surprisingly, it wasn't easy to find a sub during COVID. But that's fine. That's fine. I, I've enjoyed this 10-week series. I hope you have too. We are on a journey to come and see. Come and see the authentic Jesus. And this is our journey that we're taking as we head towards Easter this year. And of course, as Easter approaches, that also means Palm Sunday and the Last Supper and the Garden Prayer and the Cross. And this is an important journey for us to take. This is a pilgrimage that Christians make every single year. It not only draws us closer, I think, to Jesus every year, but it also reminds us why he came. On his own journey to the cross, Jesus takes along with him 12 disciples, and it was his plan to pour into these 12 individuals to teach them and grow them, inspire them, so that one day his mission of all would be their mission of all, and so that they would continue his healing ministry, his preaching ministry, his teaching ministry. And so one day, Jesus asks them a very important question. Matthew 16 says, Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. You know, there's really so much to look at. Matthew 16 is just rich in what you and I need to know about being his disciple. I mean, first, he told them, right? He confirmed their suspicions. He solidified it for them. He said, yes, I am the Messiah, right? But then he added to that. He said, I am also going to build a church. So now we have a mission. We have a plan. We're building something. We're doing something. We are going to change the world. And changing the world is pretty exciting stuff. And I think naturally, hearing good news, you would want to run out and tell everyone the good news. But Jesus says, don't say anything. Why not? Why not share this good news? Well, because perhaps it's not all good news. If you pick up at verse 21, it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Well, now we have a little more information. And it's not, the, it's not the news we were hoping for, right? Perhaps the disciples had all these ideas about who the Messiah would be and what he would do. But this is our locker room huddle, and the coach is honest. And the coach says, we are going to lose. And Peter says, what? No way. We, we can't lose with you. This, this isn't the way it's supposed to go. But Jesus says, this is the way it's supposed to go. Who the world says the Messiah is, what they think that he is going to do, it's so much different than who I am. Peter and the disciples are broken up. To them, this is a loss. The Pharisees win. Rome wins. Jesus is arrested. He's killed. How can this be? This went against everything they had hoped for in this image of a warrior messiah. 
They had seen Jesus' miracles. They had heard his teaching. They had witnessed firsthand how just his mere presence changed people and gave them hope. Surely he is going to be their victor. Well, Jesus was going to be their victor. But it wasn't a war with the Jewish ruling class. And it wasn't a war with Rome. Jesus has a much bigger battle ahead of him. Verse 24 says, Then Jesus took his disciples, and he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Once again, the call to follow, right? Jesus encourages each person in this room at the very beginning of the relationship when he meets them for the very first time, he says, follow me, right? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Each disciple leaps at the opportunity. They're going to leave behind blue collar work and they're going to go follow a rabbi. Great news. But now at the end of the ministry, your teacher, his final instructions to you, he says, now that you have followed me, I want you to continue to follow me all the way to the cross. So today I wanted to examine what that means, to come and see Jesus, but to also ask, what would make someone take up a means of execution and then follow them willingly to their death? Let's turn one page over in our text to Matthew chapter 17, and begin reading the rest of this fascinating story. So then, in Matthew chapter 17, which is our next chapter over, right at the top in verse 1 it says, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So Matthew, our gospel writer, he makes a point. He makes a point in telling us six days later, six days after he tells them he's going to die, six days after he says, pick up your cross and follow me. He takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John on a field trip, really. He takes them up a mountain. And we should always look at numbers. Numbers are very important in the Bible. So think, What's the importance of six days to you? Like when you, when you hear that phrase, six days in the Bible, what comes to mind? What image comes to mind? Probably Genesis, right? Genesis, God creates the world in six days. Creation is six days long. On the seventh day, God rests, right? And so Matthew here mentioning six days, this is a literal clue for us. It's, it's telling the reader that this is going to be a new creation. Here's a new creation story. And perhaps in this moment, it's going to have something to do with beginnings, something to do with maybe a new genesis, a new start. And we think about God being in that moment right? Creation and Genesis, this is a God moment. So perhaps this moment on the mountain is going to be another God moment. And you know, like we said, for generations, people have been waiting for this Messiah. They've been hoping and expecting the Messiah to come. And all through the gospel stories that we've been reading through these uh, 10 weeks, Jesus has been doing his thing, right? He's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing. And the people have all been speculating. They've been watching and they've been trying to figure him out. And some of them even try to nail him down with questions. And they say, are you the one who is to come? Are you the Messiah? 
Matthew 11, 3 says, are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? So maybe before we can answer that question, we first have to answer another. Why did the world need a Messiah? Well, in the first six days, that creation story, God makes the world, God makes the Garden of Eden, and he makes two people, Adam and Eve. And now these people, Adam and Eve, they were supposed to be the first caretakers. They were the first shepherds, and they had a responsibility, both in their relationship with God and to each other. God's first law in Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and they hurt their relationship with each other, and they hurt the relationship with God. And even in these very first pages of Genesis, within the very first story, we see the promise that they, even they, needed a Savior. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And the he in that passage, that's Jesus. And so generations later, we have a new shepherd. We have a man named Moses. Moses leads the people out of bondage and brokenness, and he takes them to a valley of green pastures and still waters. And the people were given the law and the sacrificial system. So the holy nation is given a new hope, a new system, a new identity. They're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. But like any other system or like any other law, it looks great on paper. It looked like a good fix on paper. But in the end, it didn't fix things. It only delayed the inevitable. So on his deathbed, the shepherd, Moses, he prays for another shepherd. He prays for a new shepherd for his people. Moses prays in Numbers 27, let the Lord, the God of the spirit of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in. And the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. So a savior was promised, a Messiah was promised. And now here in Matthew 16 and 17, we're reading, it's Jesus. And people are asking, right? Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the person who's going to fix everything? This is what the disciples are asking. Is the shepherd that we've been waiting for, the one that was promised, is he here? Is this finally the new Adam? Is this the new firstborn son of God? Is this the new Moses? Is this the new Joshua? Is this the new King David? So that's the question, right? That's the question. Is Jesus the answer to all these things? Well, come and see, right? And and then so Jesus asks the question to his own disciples. He says, who do people say that I am? And they all take a turn guessing, right? And then Peter is the one who bravely says, you are the one that was promised. And Jesus says, you're right. And and they should have recognized him. They should have. Because Jesus was the perfect Israelite. 1 Peter 2 says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus was also the perfect king. Matthew 21 says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to your daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus was also the perfect priest, Hebrews 4 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 
Jesus is all of those things. So they should have recognized him. And when he asked, who am I? Who do people say that I am? They should have all responded with, you're the man, right? You're the Messiah. You are God alone. You should be worshipped. But they didn't. So Jesus is a teacher. And he takes them up a mountain to teach them a lesson. He takes them up the mountain to show them. Matthew 17 continues in verse 2. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. And if you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And this story is typically called the Transfiguration. It's probably titled that even in your Bible. The word transfigured is right there in the Greek. Uh, We transcribe it from the Greek word metamorpho. And you know that word, right? It's the same word that we use in English for metamorphosis, the process that uh, a caterpillar takes when they become a butterfly. It's a compound word. Meta means against, or meta means after, and morph means form. So, In this moment, the three disciples, they see Jesus, they recognize him, but then he changes his form. They think he's one way, right? They think he's one way, and then he changes. He shows them a new side of himself that they'd never seen before, which is very different, right? What did it look like? What did the passage say? The passage says, And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Well, anybody who watched that scene or saw that, or even was reading this in a text, they would recognize that as the holy glory of God. The same holy glory that Moses had when Moses would meet with God face to face. Exodus 34 says, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak to him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, The people of Israel would see the face of Moses and the skin of Moses' face was shining. Moses' face shines with all of the holy glory just by being in God's presence. And here in Matthew 17, Jesus' whole body have this glow. His clothes have this glow. So whatever Moses had, Jesus has a whole lot more, right? Plus, Jesus is standing there with Moses. Jesus is standing there with Elijah, or at least beings that look like Moses and Elijah. Why is that significant? Well, think about who Moses and Elijah represent. Moses is the great leader. He's the great lawgiver. And Elijah is one of the greatest prophets. And Jesus is the son. So you have three glowing beings right? That sounds a lot like the story found in Genesis 18. Genesis 18 says, The Lord appeared to Lot by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Three beings arrive, and Lot bows down to the earth, and Lot calls the three of them Lord. They're not angels. They are three beings of the heavenly trinity. They are the Father, who is the lawgiver, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the word trinity doesn't even appear in our Bibles. It's a... theology word. It's a Bible study church word that we came up with later. It's our way of saying God is everything and he's even more than we expect. 
He is three, but he is one. Paul writes in Colossians 3.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. Verse 19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain after having told them, You should have recognized me. Right? You should have recognized me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. And perhaps the disciples are still confused about who Jesus is and who the Messiah is supposed to be. Jesus takes his students. He takes his disciples on a field trip. Come and see the triune God. Come and see the Trinity. This is so profound. This is world-changing stuff. And it's all revealed to us right here. And there's so much here, so much to see. Jesus renews the six days of creation. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus stands and shines with the holy glory of God. He is the lawgiver like Moses. He is the prophet like Elijah. What a special moment. What a revelation. So let's tell everybody, right? Let's go down the mountain. Let's tell everybody. Matthew 17, 9 says, And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one this vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then a little further down the page, on verse 22, it says, As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And he'll be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. And again, we see Jesus tell the disciples that they are supposed to keep his godhood a secret. And again, Jesus reminds them, this is all going to end at the cross. This isn't going to go the way that you think. He wasn't going to be the Messiah that everybody thought that he would be. And perhaps through this study that we are doing together, we've also been seeing a Jesus, a Messiah, that we didn't expect either. I mean, he, he's not just a lion. He's also a lamb. He's not just holy. He's just. He's not just merciful. He's also mighty. He can be a warrior and he can be a shepherd. He came from a poor working class family, but he was also a king. Just like the people who knew and saw Jesus back then and perhaps misunderstood who he was and why he came, the same could be said for people today. Most liked the warrior aspect of Jesus, but not the shepherd. They wanted an overthrower. They wanted a military leader. Last week we said Jesus was the new Joshua and Joshua led the people, but he also led the armies. Joshua helped Israel overthrow their enemies. And most people were expecting a warrior Messiah like that. But Jesus was also a shepherd, a shepherd who loved his sheep, a shepherd who once said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What does that mean? Well, it means Easter is coming. It means the Christ must suffer. It means the Messiah must die. Jesus was going to war against sin and darkness and death. Jesus was going to repair all the damage that Eden caused. He was going to heal the wound of Israel. He was going to be the permanent solution to the sacrificial system. The cross wasn't going to be another quick fix or a band-aid. The cross was going to be a once and for all. And the crazy thing about Christianity is Jesus then calls us to do the same thing. Matthew 26 says, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me.
You know, last week we asked what shepherd would give up their own life for the sheep. Truly, it would be a shepherd like no other. But now we have a big ask of the sheep. Take up your cross and follow him. Who would do that? I mean, if you saw a guy beaten and bloody and carrying his cross through town, what you see and are thinking is, wow, I sure wouldn't want to be that guy. Nobody's jealous. Nobody wishes that we were them. But for the Christian, Jesus turns to you and smiles and says, follow me. Who does that? Who willingly picks up their cross and follows in that moment? Why follow? Because you believe he's worth it. That's the only reason. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't much like the pick up your cross and follow passage. I'm, I'm more of an Ecclesiastes 8.15 kind of disciple. I mean, you know Ecclesiastes 8.15. I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Eat, drink, and be merry, right? This is the greatest pursuit of humanity. This is the goal of the world. This is how we spend our time. We maximize pleasure, we minimize pain. And if you can do that, if you can live a life like that, then job well done, life well lived. But that is not the call that is set before the disciple. Jesus stands on the mountain and he reveals to Peter, James, and John, I am God. Jesus says, come and see God. And they got to see Jesus as God. And with that revelation comes this big ask, take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean? What does taking up your cross and what does discipleship mean? Well, it's all right there in this one passage. What does Jesus ask of us? Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So the first thing we see is a disciple has to lay something down. Notice the passage does not begin with pick up your cross. It begins with what? Deny yourself. Now the Greek word there means to not associate with or to make a stranger of. Paul says in Galatians 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That means our first act as a disciple is we recenter ourselves. The world doesn't revolve around us. The world revolves around God. So denying ourselves means we now seek the good of others. We start looking out for those around us instead of ourselves. Because when you're willing to sacrifice your time and your energy, when you're willing to sacrifice your rights and your position and your reputation and your privileges and your comforts, even your life, for the sake of Jesus, you exemplify what it means to deny yourself. Just like Jesus says, whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And then after, the disciple lays something down, they then pick something up. It says, take up your cross. And when Jesus speaks of the cross, he speaks of death and dying to ourselves that we might follow Christ wherever he leads. And here's a picture, literally, of giving everything up, even at the cost of our own life. And when Jesus takes up his cross, he's carrying the means of his death. It means he's a willing participant that he gives up his life for the sake of the world. That means he's consenting to suffering and humiliation and torture and death and all of these things and all these asks that he makes of us. This is certainly the most troubling. Nothing about choosing pain and humiliation is natural for us, which is why these words are so hard to follow, but yet they bring us comfort because he concludes it by saying, and follow me. So we live something out. He does it first, right? He does it best. He gave the most. He sacrificed all. And being Jesus' disciple involves a denial of self 
and, and, and taking an active involvement in choosing to walk towards death in order that we would gain Christ. That's an active choice. That is something that we choose to do. We're saying, I want to be a willing participant in the hard and holy work of putting myself and my wishes second in order to gain Christ. Paul says in Philippians 4, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. For us, the bottom line is that we follow the shepherd to wherever he's leading. And where he leads us typically is away from a me-centered world and an inward-focused life to a god centered world, to an outward focused life. Jesus' act on the cross was an act for all. It was what he did at the cost of himself for all. And he did it because he could do it. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Just like our heavenly shepherd, we are called to a higher purpose and a larger view. But most are content to aim for the pleasures of life. And if that's all you care about, eat, drink, and be merry, I, that's an easy goal. That's easily obtainable. But eventually we lose it. Christ calls us to aim for heaven. Christ tells us that when he returns, he would rather give us a crown of glory. You know, at the Transfiguration, Jesus wasn't just confirming to his disciples that he was God. He was showing them the promise of what was to come. Why deny yourself? Why pick up your cross? Why follow? Why choose a life where the reward comes later? Love. With Jesus, it always comes back to love. The love of our brothers and sisters, the love of our church, the love of this community, the love of your family, the love of your Savior. And as we journey to the cross and to the empty tomb this Easter, remember, this is not a scene that we observe. This is not a spectacle that we watch. Jesus asks us to be active and willing participants. We are the sheep, we are the disciples, and we follow. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and daily follow. Amen.